Okay, let's get started. A couple of reminders. None. It's, you're just back from spring break, so you're no mood from the reminders. But um, your DCF valuation is due next Friday. You saying what DCF valuation? I'm not even going there. Okay. I sent you a to-do list just before the break that I know you probably junked, but I'll send it again because it kind of chronicles exactly the steps you need to go through. It's not that complicated. You just need to set aside a few hours, I would say two to three hours, to get the process going. You can always revisit your valuations. But you have to get started. If you keep putting off getting started, then nothing is going to get done. Okay? So again, it's not for grading. It's for the feedback. So you know, get, get started as soon as you can. The other is the second half of the class, things will start speeding up, partly because other classes have stuff coming due. This class will have more stuff coming due as well. So try not to fall behind because the material will start building up. Okay? So you ready? Let's get started. As, as always, let's start with some tests to, because today we're going to start talking about actually valuing companies. So here's my first question. One of the first things we're going to talk about today are employee options. Vastly misunderstood, hugely misanalyzed. But a big issue, many companies, less of an issue than it was five years ago or ten years ago, and we'll talk about what's changed. But let's start with something that a lot of analysts do that I think they should not do. But it, it, fundamentally, it, you, you know, it sounds reasonable. Companies grant options to employees, right, as part of compensation packages. And many analysts, when they look at companies, add back those. And right now, if you look at accounting, you're required to expense those options when they're granted. So if you look at the income statement for a Cisco, one of the expense items will be options expense, and the income is after those expenses. Using the logic that those options are not cash, people add back the option expenses to report earnings before those option expenses. Do you think we should do that? And if not, why not? Jordan. Um, it's payment to employees. The form that it takes is shares, I think, is irrelevant. If the company just issued shares and paid the employees in cash, they'd have to report it and would it be an ad back? I, I don't disagree with you, but you can see why a purist is going to say, but it's not cash. Right? So let's do an existing stock order. And I'm a company. I can either pay my employees with cash or I can pay them with options. 
If I pay them with cash, what happens? You get less in cash flows, right? If I pay them with options, you get to get more cash flows. But what do you give up? A share of the ownership. That's really, if I could somehow bring up the share of the ownership separately into my valuation, then it's okay to add back the expenses. We'll talk about why it's almost impossible to bring in the share of the ownership. Why is it? If I granted shares, it's easy to bring in the share of ownership, right? Because I know how many, what's the problem with options? Well, they can exercise it or not exercise it. They, and we don't know when they'll exercise it. So there's this nebulous, maybe here, maybe not, which makes it almost impossible to bring into your ownership shares, which effectively means you can't adjust the denominator for the number of shares outstanding, which is why we need to treat it as if it was a cash expense. So we'll come back and talk a little bit more about this, but this is, I think, something that's incredibly confusing in all its different dimensions. We'll also start valuing companies, perhaps one or two today. Let's assume that I'm valuing a bank. I use the dividend discount model value, and in fact, we've talked about variations of this in the context of looking at growth and earnings, so you might be able to draw on that. Let's say I value the bank at $12 per share using a dividend discount model. The Fed or whatever central bank passes a rule saying that every bank will now need more regulatory capital to deliver the same business. What effect will this have on my value per share? Increased value per share, decreased value per share have no impact on value per share. By itself, it seems like bad news, right? Why? Because more regulatory capital to deliver the same income means I'm going to have lower return in equity, lower excess returns. So the first level impact is going to be negative. But can you think of a potential positive that comes out of this? Are all banks equally hurt by this? Well, some banks are going to be actually hurt more because they're more undercapitalized. And if this is a comparative business, you might actually be able to use it. I mean, it, it requires a lot of contortions to go along the way. But while it's bad news across the board, you might actually find that some banks actually emerge from this as more powerful than they were before they went into this, because this might become your competitive advantage, is now you need more regulatory capital. You have access to that regulatory capital. You already have it. It might work out to your benefit. We'll talk about how to bring that in, but you can see it's a pretty complex issue. So it can affect, show up in evaluation lots of different places. It could show up as lower dividends because you've got to cut dividends. It can show up as lower growth if, in fact, you have to reinvest more to deliver it. It can show up as in terms of a future payout ratio, future dividends, or it can even affect your risk. In what way? Now that the bank has changed the regulatory capital, it's opened the door that it could do this again, right? So there's this uncertainty about regulatory capital that you've introduced that can affect your value. So every aspect of a bank can be changed, and therefore the value can be different. One final example, and this is actually something we will not get to today, but we will actually talk about in the next session. I'm going to value some young companies. Okay? Let's say you're valuing a young, high-growth company. You discount cash flows back to today to come up with a value of equity of $100 million. Company has 10 million shares outstanding right now. But because it has these huge reinvestment needs in the future, you expect it to be able to issue more shares. It has to issue more shares to cover those reinvestments in the future. Another two and a half million shares. So here's a, I have a very simple question. I've done the dirty work of valuing the company, projecting out cash flows and discounting the bag. I've come up with a value of 100 million. I want a value per share. There are only 10 million outstanding right now. I could divide by the 10 million, come up with $10 per share. I could take the 12 and a half million, which is including the two and a half million that they will have to issue, which is going to be eight dollars per share. Maybe the value is somewhere between eight and ten. Maybe it's more than ten, in which case you've got to tell me some really good story about why issuing more shares is good for you, or less than eight. What do you think? Should I divide by ten million shares, twelve and a half million shares, some number in the middle? None of the above. What's in the numerator? my present value of cash flows, right? Why am I issuing all these shares? Because I have big reinvestment needs. You know, big reinvestment needs, do those show up in my cash flow somewhere? What does reinvestment need mean? CapEx, work, working capital. 
So my cash flows were probably very negative in years one, two, three, four, five, which is why I'm issuing these two and a half million shares, right? You see where I'm going? When I compute my present value, those negative cash flows I have in years one, two, three, four, five are already discounted. My present value today is lower because I have those negative cash flows. If I divide by 12 and a half million shares, I'm actually double counting. Do you see where I'm double counting? I'm lowering in my numerator because I have negative cash flows, and I'm raising the denominator for exactly the same reason. You can't do both. It actually is incredibly good news because it means when you do the discounted cash flow valuation of a young high growth company, you can divide by the number of shares outstanding today and get away with it even though you know there's going to be future dilution because that future dilution is already built into my present value. It might seem like magic, but it actually works really well. And it takes a huge load off your shoulders because you don't have to estimate how many shares will be issued in year one, year two, year three, year four. It doesn't matter. Any questions on that? We'll, so when I, do a real, when I do one of these young high growth companies, you're going to see this play out. And we can come back and deal with this if you have any loose ends on this issue. So let's go back to the, the last couple of loose ends on intrinsic valuation. Okay. So if you remember, we're talking about complexity. Joseph. Okay, so let's pause right there. So you're, you're the press. So let's say it's tomorrow. Sure. You're going to issue 10 million shares. So what's going to happen after you issue 10 million shares? Right after the issue, what's going to happen? Oh, There's cash coming in, right? right? So tomorrow, if I value your company, what's going to be different? My number of shares will be higher by 10 million. And, then and my numerator is going to be higher by cash. So. That's why, and it, it, again, it means that you don't have to kind of spend too much energy at the margin saying, what will happen if they do this tomorrow? Okay? Okay. In fact, I'm going to value a company called CRH for tomorrow's uh, session, if you've never heard of it. It's one of the largest construction materials companies in the world. It's an Irish company. It's a global company. It's based in Ireland. And I'm valuing it not because I'm particularly fascinated by it, but it just actually was the recipient of a benefit because as a result of the merge of Hoxton and Lafarge, I think two big, or uh, Hockim and Le, uh, two European construction companies, they were required to divest themselves of almost $6 billion worth of assets. And they had to sell it to CRH to get the merger approved. And that actually has had a big effect on CRH stock price. So I'm going to value CRH. I don't know, and the reason I can't value what they're getting is, I don't know much about the assets they're getting. All I know is how much they're paying for it. And the market's telling me it's good news, it's good news, but I don't see the earnings, I don't have the cash flows. So the value CRH, I'm going to value it just before the $6.2 billion acquisition. You know what the effect of the acquisition is going to be? Think of it like a project. What's the effect of a project on value? It's a net present value of that investment, right? So if what they're getting is greater than 6.2 billion, their value as a company will increase by that difference. If it's a fair value acquisition, it'll have no effect on the valuation. And if they've overpaid, it's actually going to reduce the value. So what I'm going to use that to illustrate is the effect of what will happen to your company if, let's say, this could happen to any of your companies. In fact, it will happen to at least 10% of your companies. Sometime next month, you think you're done with the DCF valuation, and your company is going to announce a divestiture or an acquisition. You can say, oh my God, what am I going to do now? Just let it go. Okay? Not much you can do without the information. The effect of the divestiture acquisition is going to be in terms of almost the value, the incremental effect of that decision. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, so let's go back to where we were. We were looking at complexity and how it affects value. The two more loose ends I want to talk about. One is something I thought we'd put to sleep, but I don't think we fully did which was what, what to include in debt. When we did cost of capital, the rules we kind of created for what should be in debt were very simple. In fact, they were very narrow. I said, when you count debt and cost of capital, stick with just interest-bearing debt and lease commitments. And some of you said, what about underfunded life and a pension obligation? I said, don't worry about them now. We'll come back and deal with them later because they're not a source of capital for investments. Just stick with interest-bearing debt and lease commitment. So for cost of capital, we define debt narrowly. 
We use it to come up with the cost of capital, we discount cash flows, we come up with the value of the operating assets, and what do we do to get the value of equity? We first add back cash and cross holdings, and then we subtract out debt again. So we have to come back to this question of what do I count as debt now that I've got to the stage of subtracting out debt? And there I think there are a couple of tricky issues. And I think, and I, one of these issues I don't know a clean answer to, so I think I, I'd like you to kind of give me a suggestion of what we should do. The rule in cost of capital is the weights for equity and debt should be based on what? Market value or book value? Market value. Always market value because book value means nothing because it's, what, it's market value weights. So you come up with the value of the business, now you come back to the question. When I subtract our debt to get from the value of the firm to value of equity, should I be subtracting out market value or book value? You see my question? When I did cost of capital, I said, oh, it's always market value. Now I've come back to the question. I have to come back with a debt to subtract out. Should I subtract out market value or book value? Do you think book? OK, so, you, so Jordan says book. Anybody want to? Unless they can redeem without paying a Well, I mean, let's assume that this is actually, it's dead old, that, you know, that if they liquidated today, they'd have to pay the book value of debt. You open up any valuation textbook, you know what the answer is going to be? Market value. It's actually one of the most troubling parts of discounted cash flow valuation. And here's why. Let's assume that you're valuing a distressed company. You discount the free cash flow as a firm back at the cost of capital. You come up with a billion as value for the operating assets. And let me load the dice here. This company has a billion dollars in book value debt. But because the company is distressed, that debt is trading at half of book value. So when you did cost of capital, that's what you used as your debt, is the 500 million. So now you get to a point, I say, what do I subtract out to get to my value of equity? There are two, two possible answers, and, th and this is why it's going to matter. You could tell me the equity is worth nothing because I have a billion dollars in value, and if I liquidated the firm today, I would get, I'd have to pay out the billion because the bank is not going to settle for half of that. Or you can say the equity is worth a half a billion because it's a difference between the value of the operating assets and the market value of debt. Well, when we do DCF valuation, what exactly are we doing? We're doing a going concern valuation, right? So the 500 million that I get as market value for debt reflects the present value of the coupon and the face value. Actually, I'm assuming I'm going to be able to pay them off, but because of the risk, the value is lower. So on a going concern basis, it actually and it sounds incredibly strange. The value of the equity is actually a half a billion because the debt's market value is what you would value it at as a going concern. If I did a liquidation valuation, the game changes, right? So liquidation valuation, it's, no, it's a no-brainer, always book value. But if you did Go a distressed exchange, it's still a going concern technically, isn't it? Well, if you can buy, buy back the debt at half a billion, you'd be able to claim the difference, right? But here's the problem. If I, as a healthy company, tried to buy this company, the minute I announce I'm going to try to buy the company, you know what's going to happen to the market value of the debt? It's going to pop up to a billion. That's why I said it's one of those unresolved mysteries because DCF valuation says take a going concern view of the world, compute market values, take the difference, but this is one of those cases where you'll have to probably do three separate valuations of the company. One is a going concern to the existing owners of the company, one is a going concern to somebody trying to buy the company, and one is a liquidation valuation. And my guess is you're going to end up closer to zero. So Jordan's initial answer was probably very close to the truth of what you're going to get because that debt is going to rise up to the billion dollars and you're not going to have any equity value left. So very different rules again. Cost of capital, you'd, there's, no, there's no ifs or buts there. You always go with the half a billion as your market value for the debt. But if you do the value of equity, you might actually subtract out the entire billion even though the market value is only a half a billion, because if somebody tried to buy this company and they have the capacity to pay off the debt, that's what's going to happen to the market value of the debt. Generally speaking, though, when you say you have to go back to the market value of debt, or? We just did, like, for two, so what is it, three sessions ago? In fact, there's a very simple way to figure out the market value of debt. All you need to do is look at the book interest rate, right, which is, which is right there, interest expense, so and compare it to either a synthetic rating base or an actual rating based market interest rate. And the numbers are very different. 
Your debt's market value is much, much different than the book value. So in fact, we computed the market value of debt by using that very simple, it's like pricing a bond. So it's not that the debt has to be traded. It's just that the book interest rate has lost a relationship with the market interest rate. It's much, much lower than the market interest rate of this debt. Right? Here's your last chance also to mop up any more loose ends. So here are a couple of loose ends. Remember those underfunded pension obligations and healthcare obligations that I said, don't worry about when you did cost of capital? Now I'm going to change my answer. When you get to this point in the process, start worrying about them. Why? Because if you're an equity investor in this company and you have a lot of underfunded pension obligations, this is your last chance to bring them into the process. Of course, you can always look to the government and hope they will bail you out, but th that might not happen. But if you have underfunded pension or healthcare obligations, you need to subtract them out. Also, if you're the target of a lawsuit, and which US company is it? This is your last chance to kind of deal with this. We would have been valuing a tobacco company any time in the last 30 years. This is always the ever-present danger, right? Your cash flows look great, your earnings look great, your value can be, in fact, on an intrinsic value basis, if you did conventional valuation, for much of the last 30 years, tobacco companies have looked cheap. But what's hanging over the head of your valuation is the potential for you could have this huge lawsuit that tomorrow could wipe out a third of your firm. So what do you do about those? What do you do about a lawsuit in your firm which potentially could put half your value or a third of your value or three quarters or all of your value at risk? What do I need to do? I'd argue if you can estimate two things, you can deal with lawsuits. What are the two things? One is the probability that you will end up losing the lawsuit. Second is how much you will have to pay. And I'll tell you, those are nightmare numbers to estimate, right? Because it's not a one-time game. You lose in the first round, you can have appeals processes, and by the time it's all done, who knows what that number is going to look like. And you could have a $5 billion jury, you know, verdict against you, and by the time it's all done, it could be 50 million. I've tried, and these companies, I give up on. Because this, is, this has nothing to do with finance anymore. This has everything to do with understanding the legal process and how it works out. I remember about five years ago, a couple of um, law students on the verge of graduation came down the street to, to my office, and they dropped by and they said, um, we're not that interested in becoming lawyers. And so, isn't this a little late in your life to be making this judgment? You've been in law school for three years. And they said, we'd like to be in investing. Can you make a couple of suggestions? And I said, two ways you can approach this. One is you can say, I'm going to learn all the DCF valuation I can in the next six months and try to become a banker. I said, why don't you try something different? Do you hang up a shingle? And you're going to be investment specialists. And you're going to specialize only in companies that have been targeted in lawsuits. And the only thing you're going to be doing is assessing these two numbers that investors have a tough time assessing. Probability of losses. So you can say it's a Louisiana case. Maybe there's a higher chance of jury verdicts being huge there because of the So you know the system much better than the rest of us do. Make that you. And in the US, if you are really good about assessing those two numbers, you're going to make a ton of money over time. Because investors have no idea what to do with these. If you remember with Merck and the Viox lawsuits, for about five years, this is all Merck's stock price used to do. Every month, there'd be another jury verdict in some state. If the verdict was in Merck's favor, the stock price would pop 10%. If it was against Merck, it would drop 10%. You know, like, you know, and that's basically what drove the stock price for almost five years. So if you have a huge lawsuit that's hanging over a company, that is, in fact, the cleanest way to do it, I'm not saying it's easy, is to separate the lawsuit from everything else, assess those two expected value numbers, and take that out of the value of your equity. Okay. Any questions? So now let's talk about equity options. So basically, we're not talking about options traded on the CBOE. Those listed options have nothing to do with me as a stockholder in the company. They're side bets between buyers and sellers of options. I'm talking about options issued by companies, which means I'm talking about employee options. I'm talking about warrants issued by companies to raise equity. I'm talking about conversion options and convertible bonds. So we're talking about a whole bunch of options issued by companies. 
And the reason they worry me as a stockholder is not the dilution. Dilution itself is not the issue. It's a fact that they're diluted at a discounted price. Do you see why? Because with an option, I essentially allow people to buy shares at a fixed price, and they exercise that option only if that price is lower than the market price. So first, let's dispense with the delusion about options. Options are not worrisome because they create delusion. It's because they create delusion at a discounted price that they affect me. So the question becomes, how do we factor in this expected future dilution when we don't know whether they'll be exercised and what price they'll be exercised at? So the key here is to recognize that when you issue options, you've given somebody the right to buy shares at a fixed price. And that's going to happen only if the price is lower than the market price. So let's talk about different ways of dealing with options. And I'm going to start with the most naive way of dealing with equity options and go all the way to what I think is the right way. Okay? So let's set up an example. Let's assume you have a company which has $100 million in free cash as a firm, growing 3% a year in perpetuity with an 8% cost of capital. Let's say it has no cash outstanding, 100 million shares, and a billion dollars in debt. So if you ask me to value the equity per share in this company, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take the cash flow, divided by the cost of capital minus the growth rate. That gives me the value of the operating assets. I'm going to subtract out the debt because there's no cash. I'll just go directly to the debt. I get a value for the equity, divide by the number of shares. I get a value per share of $10 per share. So that was easy, right? We're done. Now let's assume this company, the instant after you finish evaluation, decides to give 10 million options with a strike price of 10. See why I picked the strike price of 10? The value per share is 10. So it's an at the money option. It's given 10 million options to its CEO. You're the old stockholders. Remember the value that I got was $10? I've now thrown in this new issue. And my question is purely about the effect it will have on your estimated value per share. And I'll give you the three choices. One is that they'll have no effect. Why? Because these options are at the money. The exercise value is zero. The second is that the value per share will decrease by 10% simply because you now have 10 million more shares potentially outstanding. That's a dilution effect. The third is it will decrease but by less than 10% because even though you have more shares outstanding, for those shares to get exercised will mean that cash comes into the company. No effect, 10% or less than 10%. How many think will have no effect? And that's what accountants told us for 25 years, right? If you issue options at the money, it'll have no effect on your existing stockholders. Do you really, as stockholders, you're not any more, so you're saying that when I issue, so if I issued 100 million shares at $10 per share, you'd still have no problem? What about a billion shares at $10 per share? I would say it depends on like, what they were to do with the money. Well, there's nothing coming in. Right now, all I'm doing is issuing options. There's no money coming in. There's no money going out, right? So if I issue 10 million shares at the money, there's no effect, and you don't worry, then I might as well make it 100 million, right? That's exactly what technology firms did in the 1990s. They said, if it's costless, why should we stop at 10? Why not issue 50? But for, I'd like somebody on the other side to tell me why I should be worried, more worried now than I was before this option issue happened. Perrine? Potential dilution, right? So in a sense, what you've created with an option, right now the exercise value is zero, but there's a life left in the option, right? Remember option pricing? An at-the-money option doesn't sell for nothing. You try it on the CBOE, take a stock, take an option that is trading at the exercise price roughly, you're not going to be able to buy it for nothing. An option has value as long as it has life. And guess who pays for that option? You do. In fact, we're laying the pathway for why options affect the value of equity per share. It's not because people exercise these options today that should worry you. It's a fact that these options could potentially be exercised in the future. You're saying, we don't know. Nobody does, but that's what an option value does. It takes into account the likelihood that your option will be exercised and values the option. So I'm going to take you through the three approaches for dealing with options. And you're going to see all the different scenarios play out. And you're going to see why I, am, I think it's so problematic to do what many analysts do in terms of how they deal with options. So here's the first one. 
It's called the fully diluted approach. I call this the bludgeon approach. It's for that, uh, for that, for that analyst whose only device is dealing with the number of shares. So here's what he does. He values the equity at a billion, just like I did before. But then he divides by the fully diluted number of shares, saying, it could happen, but I'm a conservative analyst. So because I'm conservative, I'll act like all of these options will get exercised. I'll count the number of shares I would have if these options get exercised. My value per share will drop by roughly 10%. What's wrong with this? What am I missing? What, uh, fundamentally, forget about the option pricing time premium. There's something even more fundamental that I'm missing. If I take this argument to its logical limit and all these options get exercised right away, what happens? <coughs> See, 10 million options get exercised. What is the strike price? $10. So 10 times 10 is a 100 million. If nothing else, if you're going to carry this to its logical limit, that 100 million should be coming in as cash, right? It's an incredibly sloppy way of dealing with options because even internally it's not logical because if you say I'm going to count the shares that are going to be outstanding if the options get exercised, you also have to count in the cash that would come in from the exercise. So that's why I call it the bludgeon approach. It doesn't even make sense internally. You're just adjusting the number of shares for options outstanding. That's why when you look at these partially diluted, fully diluted earnings per share, ignore them. They're completely and totally meaningless because all you're doing is changing the number of shares in the denominator, acting like all these options will become live shares, and nothing comes into the firm when those options get exercised. So that's a fully diluted approach, but maybe 10% of all analysts use that approach. Okay. Here's the much more common approach. It's called the treasury stock approach. And it does what I suggested you need to logically do if these options get exercised early, which is, there's going to be cash coming in. It takes the $100 of cash coming into the firm. It adds it to the value of equity and then divides by the 110 million shares. And if you do that, guess what? You make your accountants really happy because you confirm their biases, which is that the money it doesn't make any sense. But it makes sense because if you exercise the options today, this is exactly what's going to happen is the cash comes in, you divide by it's a little more sensible than the bludgeon approach because at least it's internally consistent. May I ask you a question though? What if these options were out of the money? Then what do you do in a treasury stock approach? Do you assume that people exercise even though it's out of the money? You know what, what treasury stock approaches do? They count only the options in the money. They ignore the options out of the money. And therein, you can see, lies the seeds of a problem. Because if I issue a billion options, 10 cents, above the stock price, you say ignore them. And I issue one option below the stock price, the strike price below, then you count them. And that's because you're acting as if options are regular shares. It misses the time premium component of the option. Just because options are out of the money doesn't mean they don't drain value. They drain less value than in the money options. But the problem with the treasury stock approach is it completely ignores the optionality in an option. Remember, even if options are in the money, investors don't always, or employees don't exercise them right away, right? Because when you exercise an option, what happens? You get cash, but you give up the time premium on the option. So just because options have become in the money doesn't mean they get exercised, but the treasury stock approach is built on the premise that they will get exercised. So the fully diluted is completely wrong because it doesn't adjust. The treasury stock approach is internally consistent, but it misses the optionality. So what's the right thing to do then? Remember the billion dollars in equity value that you had? I gave options, right? Why do companies give options to their employees? Anybody? What? Well, that might be, but I could give them cash. I could give them shares. I could give them but options you're giving because you don't have the, let's face it, the biggest users of options tend to be these young technology companies that are trying to hire MBAs but can't pay what Goldman Sachs does. They pay in options because they don't have the cash. I mean, we can dress this up as much as you want, but options are a way you compensate employees. Part of it might be to get their interests with yours, but partly because you don't have the cash to compete for these employees otherwise which means it's a compensation expense, right? 
So when you use options, you're paying your employees with shares. I have no problem with that. But there's only one person who can pay, those, and that's you. So if I could somehow value these options for you, that's almost an expected value given future possible exercise, and subtract it from the billion dollars, I've cleaned up for the options. I don't have to just See, what I'm trying to avoid doing is changing the number of shares, because I have no idea when that will happen or how much it will happen. So if instead I can adjust the numerator for the options that have been given, I can reflect that in your equity value. So I'm going to set up a process by which I think we can deal with options better. First, I'm going to value the entire business in the aggregate. I, first thing, if you have lots of options outstanding, never do things on a per share basis. It's only going to get you into trouble. So do everything on an aggregate basis. Total cash flows, total cost of capital, value the firm. Subtract out the debt, get to the value of equity. Then value the options as options. Not an exercise value, but as options. Which means you've got to open that option pricing toolkit, right? Which you've been avoiding for a long time. But there is a reason why you learn black shoals and binomial and spend 160000 on an MBA or whatever you spend on an undergraduate degree. This is why, right? Because you're actually supposed to be able to use it, or at least you can open an Excel spreadsheet that uses it, does it for you. Right? But you've got to value these as options and subtract the value of the options from the value of equity. Do you see why I'm subtracting it out? Because that's another claim on my equity. And if I take that claim out, then I can divide by the actual shares outstanding today to get to the value per share. So the key is step three. And for the longest time, we got stuck on step three. What I mean by getting stuck on step three is we know this is the right thing to do. But for the longest time, technology firms said you can't really value employee options using Black-Scholes or binomial or option pricing models. And they were partly right and mostly wrong. Because it is true. Employee options are not like the options in the CBOE. And they're different for a few reasons. One is, you know what the length of a typical CBOE option is? Chicago boy, if you went and bought a call option in IBM, or at the most six months, most are one month, two months, three months. A typical employee option runs 10 years. So the first thing is they're much more long-term easy. Who cares? Do you remember the Black Scholes model? Act like you do. Oh, I remember it intimately. I think about it every night. Okay. One of the inputs is variance, right? And in the Black Scholes, we assume that the variance in your underlying asset doesn't change over the life of the option. Which, if it's three months, it's not a big deal. But if it's 10 years, it is a much so. The assumptions behind the Black Scholes become much more problematic for long term. It's not that the model doesn't work, but that the assumptions get a little shakier. So the first is much more long term. Second, if you buy a call option on the Chicago Board of Options and you exercise that option, the number of shares in the company doesn't change because there's nothing to do with the company. It's between you and the other side of the transaction. But when you have an employee option get exercised, the number of shares changes. There's a dilution effect that happens when an employee option gets exercised. Third, if you have a listed option, let's say you buy a listed option on, let's pick a stock, on Google. Stock price jumps $50. You bought a call option, you're happy, right? You have two, you have two choices. You can exercise the option and claim the value, or you can sell the option. If it's a listed option, Almost always, what's the better option? What, I can't use the word option with options. So what's a better choice? Sell the option or exercise it? Do I have to think too long? When, when you look at the price of an option, it'll always be exercise value plus something. Right? There's a time premium in an option. It almost never pays to exercise a listed option early. Which means you can use European option pricing models. Remember those? You can assume that every, nothing gets exercised before expiration. The Black Scholes is a European option pricing model. And you can get away with it because with listed options, early exercise almost never happens. Have any of you worked at companies where you're granted options? Okay. So when you're granted options, were you allowed to exercise it right after you're granted them? What's the first hurdle you have to get over? Vesting period, which means you've got to be around a year or a year and a half or two years before you can even do something. And then after the vesting period, of course, you're free to exercise the option 
but you're not free to sell the option. There is no liquid marketplace. Which means that if, you bought, if you're a Tesla employee who joined when the stock price was 12 and you were given options when the stock price was 20 and the stock price is now 206, 95% of your wealth is tied up in this Tesla option. You're getting really worried, right? In fact, you think the stock is overpriced. You've been listening to Elon Musk. He seems to be going a little crazy. He's saying, I need to cash out. You can't sell the option. So what do you, even though there's three years or five years left in the option, you know what you're going to do, right? You're going to exercise early. Employee options are far more likely to be exercised early because you have no liquidity. And because they get exercised early, if you use a European option pricing model like the Black Shoals, you'll misprice the option because you're assuming these options get held through expiration. So those factors have always muddied the waters. And technology firms essentially used this as their shield. They said, oh, look, these options are so difficult to value. We're going to just treat them at exercise value. So we grant millions of options at the stock price, act as if it's worth nothing. And the accountants went along with it. Finally, accounting came to its senses. As I said, it takes a while, but they finally do come to their senses. In 2007, the accounting rules were changed. And rather than treat the options as being worth exercise value, which is the rule until then, you're now, when you grant options, required to price or value those options. And guess what? The option pricing models have been adapted well enough that they do a reasonably good job of pricing for your options. Of course, you know, you can't just take the black trolls and plug the things the way you do for a listed option. There are a few adaptations, but there are models out there to value employee options. And I'll give you a couple of very quick tweaks you can make to option pricing models that take into account these factors. Let's take the option that I just described, right? Exercise price is 10, stock price is 10, or the value that you got per share was 10, 10 year maturity. 40% standard deviation, 4%. So that, that looks like a traditional option, right? S, K, R, T, and sigma. The only problem is that it is for a listed option where you don't have a dilution effect. What's a dilution effect is if you try to exercise this option, you know what's going to happen to the stock price? It's going to drop. So the $10 is almost an illusion. It looks like it's an at-the-money option, but if you try to exercise this option, bottom's going to fall out. If I can somehow adjust the stock price for the expected dilution effect, then I should be able to value this option even though it's an employee option. So here's what I do. I take the $10, which is what the existing shares, I have 100 million shares at $10. I have 10 million options outstanding, right? And there's an option value to them. I add up those two values and I come up with an overall value of equity in the company. And then divide that overall value of equity by 110 million. In this case, it turns out the value of the option is about $5.40. I have 100 million shares at $10 per share and 10 million options at $5.40 an option. I add the two up, I come up with 105 uh, or whatever it is, 1,050 million. Divided by 110 million shares, I come up with a value per share of 9.58. I use that as my input, as the S, to come up with the value of the option. Is there a kind of a problem in what I've just described. I said I use the value of the option to come up with the adjusted stock price, and I use the adjusted stock price to come up with the value of the option, right? You go into my, I, there's a spreadsheet I've built into almost every one of my DCF models for employee options. If you go check the Excel preferences, the calculation box is checked off, the iteration box is checked off, because I need the value of the option to get the adjusted stock price, and I need the, it works. You get a convergence, but effectively that's adjusting for the potential dilution in the shares that are going to occur. What that will mean is the value that you get for an option, if it's an employee option, will be lower than the value you'd have got for a listed option with exactly the same parameters. But what I'm trying to do is factor in the dilution. You saying, what about the fact that most employees exercise their options about halfway before maturity? You know what the easiest way to do that is? Bring that in. What's the what's the stated life of these options? Ten. Just use five. 
Sometimes simple solutions work fine, and that's all I do with employee options. I take whatever the life is, I cut it by half. You say, why half? Because that's roughly how, you know, I can try to finesse this and say, maybe it's 0.6, maybe it's 0.4. It's not going to make that much of a difference. So I use half the stated life, I adjust the stock price, and I move on. And what, the, what I get is my value for the options here, 54.2 million. I now subtract out from the billion dollars. I get 945.8. I divide by the 100 million shares. So the, remember a few minutes ago, your shares were worth $10 per share? I issue these 10 million options. My value per share drops to $9.46 per share. That's why we care about options. And sitting there and saying, I'm going to worry only about in the money options, or you know, only at the money, it misses the point. All options should worry you. The deep out of the money should worry you less than the deep in the money, but all options are worrisome because they're effective value of equity, and this captures that effect. This 54.2 million, when we use option pricing models, even though we never describe it as such, is an estimate of the value of these options. Everything is built into them, probability of when they'll be accessed. That's what an option pricing model tries to do, is come up with an expected dilution effect over time of having these options outstanding. Any questions? What if you have a private company? A lot of private companies give options. All that will be missing is the S that you had instead of being the actual stock price is used an estimated value per share. So th there's a second circularity that comes in then. It still handles it. Basically, it takes the intrinsic value and backs it up. But this effectively will take care of options that have already been issued. One final point. Remember I said in 2007 the accounting rules were changed requiring you to expense options when you were granted at option value? Unfortunately in the U.S. the tax guys and the accounting guys don't talk to each other. So the accounting rule writers have actually changed the rules on when options should be expensed. But the tax guys are still with the old rules which means that your options actually show up as a tax. You know that what you get to deduct for taxes is the difference between the stock price. So if you have a stock price of 80 and the strike price is 20, you get a $60 deduction. But it happens only at exercise. Which means that you could be granting millions of options while for year after year and have no tax deduction for those options. But when those options get exercised, you get a massive tax reduction. That's why when Facebook, the day they went, um, ar around the time they went public, Mark Zuckerberg had to exercise some of his options, and that created this huge tax deduction, which saved him tax. And of course, all these, I think a couple of senators, we've got to change the rules because this is so unfair. The reality is those are the ex tax deductions he should have got as a company over his lifetime as a company that he got at one deal because the tax law is screwed up. You're right, you should fix the tax law to make it at least match up to the economy. But it does create this problem, which is right now we have two sets of rules working, one for the accounting and one for the taxes. But you could technically argue that that option value that you granted is tax deductible. Basically, it is like an expense. So what I do in my discounted cash flow valuations, I value the 54.2 million in options, and I multiply by one minus the tax rate to capture the tax benefit from these options. Very simplistic but it captures the tax benefit and brings it in. It means that the weight of options is lower than it would be in otherwise because you get a tax deduction. So all of this work takes care of options you've already issued. So if you're a company that issued options in the past, this is the way to do it. Value those options, treat them as a dead weight cost, take them out of the value of the equity, divide by the actual number of shares. Know what we haven't dealt with though? a company that's continuing to issue options in the future. So it's going to continue next year, two years out, three years out, four years out. Expected future option issues, here's the easiest way to deal with them. When you do your projected cash flows, you've got revenues, you've got operating expenses, you've got operating income cash flows. Your operating expenses are supposed to include all expenses associated with generating those revenues, right? And remember how I described option grants, they're compensation expenses. And if I stay true to that notion, if I can project out what those grants will be in the future as a percentage of revenues, it's going to lower my earnings, lower my cash flows. That's the best way to deal with future option issues. Bring them into your cash flows, lower cash flows. And if anybody accuses you of double counting, as I have been multiple times, you're saying, how come you count, took out the value of the options and the value of the equity and you're counting the options and expenses of the future? They're two separate issues. 
When I subtract out the value of options in the past, I'm taking into account options that this company has given away in the past. When I do this, I'm, pre I'm estimating the effect of options that this company will grant in the future. You take a Cisco, both weights kick in, right? The company's granted a lot of options in the past. It continues to give options as part of compensation contracts. You take a look at Amazon, the options from the past are a small number now. And the company stopped issuing options as part of its compensation contracts about four years ago. So there's no future cost. There's a restricted stock grant that's much easier to take into account. So depending on the company, you can have both costs or just one, depending on what that company is doing right now. So Amazon is another example. of. A, uh, so you can go through the technology companies and you can go through the list. And many of these companies have stopped granting options as part of their compensation packages partly in reaction to the accounting changes. Yes? What if there's like inconsistent options? What do you say inconsistent? You mean volatile? Or in, ter in terms of um, them issuing options. Like they have no history of, of consistently issuing options. Consist to me, consistency just means the idea of, so one year they issue a lot of options, the next year they issue very little. Yeah, or like every like, you know, seven years or something, they'll randomly issue. You almost never get a company doing every seven years. You'll get companies that issue a lot of options some years, very little the next year. And do it that what you do with any expense that varies across time. What do we do? Just average it out as a percent of revenues. In fact, that's how I, I, I do the options. And it's become much easier now because options are expense. You can see what that option expense is as a percent of revenue each year. I mean, 3%, 1.5%, 5%, 0.2%. Just take the average across time okay. and use it for your projections. Yeah, right. Any other questions? So that's why options affect us as common stockholders. And here's the irony. The kinds of companies that grant options tend to be young technology, high growth, high risk companies, right? And think about what makes options most valuable. When you have a lot of uncertainty about the future, and the stock price is volatile. The kinds of companies that grant options are exactly the kinds of companies you have to worry about options the most because the option value tends to be so high. And you should definitely not use the exercise value in these companies because you have 10 years left on a risky company. You can grant at the money options that are extremely valuable that eat the value as an equity stockholder. Okay? So, so go through the steps. Ask yourself, why do options affect value? It's not the dilution. It's the fact that the dilution happens at a discounted price. How does it affect value? The moment you grant it, not at the time you exercise. The moment an option gets granted, you become less valuable as a stockholder. Don't wait for exercise for this to happen. It happens at the moment of granting, not at the moment of exercise. And then when the actual exercise happens, of course, you have to re rejigger the whole thing and, and factor in how it, you know, how it plays out. But once these options get exercised, they, rem they become let no the problem goes away. The number of shares gets adjusted. You can keep moving. Now let me go back to something that I did at the very start. Because at this stage, we've talked about building an intrinsic value model, cash flows, growth rates, loose ends. Right? And I said very early in this process that the key to understanding what we do is to recognize that there are two different views of the world. One is the intrinsic value view of the world, which is you come in with the cash flows and the growth rates and the discount rates, you value the company. And there are, of course, the story people who don't want to deal with numbers. And I said the key to a good valuation is to tie your valuation to a good story. That's why I want you to start thinking about your discounted cash flow valuations because you wait till the end, all you'll be able to do is punch in numbers. So I need you to start thinking about a narrative for your company, a story that you can convert into numbers. And I'll give you a very simple example of how to connect narrative to numbers. And I'll use a company that I've been kind of toying with or playing with for the last year and a half to kind of bring this home. Okay? So when I say create a narrative, I'm talking about a story you tell about the company, about how you see this company evolving over time. Which means you can tell any story you want. You can tell fairy tales. But as you go through this, you have to think about a story that makes sense. So I remember the first time I read about Uber, I'd never actually used Uber. So I read about it and it had that first $17 billion capital when it raised capital. And I went out and I started thinking about no you know, tried to find out what it did, and you know, it turned out there was a car service company. I had to talk to my nieces and nephews who took it all the time, and you know, talk to a few Uber drivers. 
But in my original valuation of Uber, I had to make, I had to come up with a story about what I thought Uber would do in the future. And here was my narrative. And I, the reason I say my, my narrative is your narrative can be different. My narrative for Uber the first time I sat down to value it was that it's a car service company that will expand the market by bringing in new users. People who would normally not have used taxis or cabs might use it. And primarily in urban environments. That's where I saw it, in New York, in London, in Paris, or wherever it is. And that it has significant competitive advantages, but these competitive advantages would not give it global networking benefits. In other words, I saw it as a car service company that will expand the market with some competitive advantages, but that it would not be able to get a, you know what I mean by global networking benefit? Essentially, that it will have this dominant market share, that you would take an Uber car in Jakarta just because you took one in New York. That was my initial narrative. And when I did my valuation, I had to think about what that whether that narrative made sense. And I, I have these three levels that I take a narrative through to, to, to determine whether I can live with the narrative. I ask, is it possible? Is it plausible? Is it probable? Three different P words. Okay? Lots of things are possible. I can tell you lots of stories about Uber. Okay? Not all of them are plausible. So if I told you Uber is going to be a transportation company, then it's much more difficult for me to defend it than if I say it's going to be a car service company or a logistics company. And not everything that's plausible is probable. And that's part of the trick in valuation, is recognizing when you've made that transition from plausible to plausible, plausible to probable. And I'll use Uber again to kind of illustrate some of the things where I've made that transition on and some of the things I'm still skeptical on. So in my original valuation, it's an urban car service company with significant competitive advantages and a local networking benefit. The way this played out in my valuation is as, as I sat down to value the company, I had to start at the top and work down. Remember, it's a young company. I can't take last year's revenues and just grow them. I don't even know what last year's revenues were, to be quite honest, because it's a private business. So the first step is I had to figure out what the potential market for the company was. And that's where the decision I made that it was an urban car service company came into play. Because if it's an urban car service company, the potential market is taxi cabs, car services in cities. The market for that globally last year was about $100 billion across the entire globe. This is all taxi service, all car service companies globally in cities. Collect. So my judgment call initially that it was going to be an urban car service company determined my potential market. If you have a different story you're thinking about for Uber, it's going to start to show up right from the first step. So if you say Uber is a transportation company, it's a much bigger potential market. It's a billion six or a trillion six. It's a huge market. But because I've called it an urban car service company, my potential market is 100 billion. So that was my start. For my market share, I had to decide whether Uber had local networking benefits or global networking benefits. What I mean by global networking benefits, again, is if Uber wins in New York, and that makes it easier for Uber to win in Jakarta, that means you have global networking benefits. If you have global networking benefits, your potential market share can be much, much higher. So if I had made the judgment that Uber had global networking benefits, I'd have given them 35, 40, 45% of the market. This is a hugely splintered market right now. The largest market share company in this market right now probably has a 0.1% market share. There are no dominant players in this market. There are no public companies. They're all little car service companies. I do think Uber has some local networking benefits, which means that you know how Uber works, right? Basically, you put in your destination, depending on the number of cars, it will take you two minutes or five minutes or 15 minutes for a car to get to you. I have both, I mean, since I started writing out Uber, I put every potential, potential, I've got Uber, I've got Lyft, I've got Sidecar, all, I just do, I never use them. I just put them to see how far they are. Because it gives me a sense of what their competitive benefits are within any city. So in New York, for instance, if you put an Uber, you might say the nearest car is three minutes away. Lyft might be seven minutes away. Why? Because there are more Uber cars in New York than Lyft cars. So that's what I mean by local networking benefits. The larger you get in a city, the easier it becomes for you to grow because it becomes more difficult for somebody else to get into that market. But I think it's local, which means that Uber could we be the winner in New York, Lyft could be the winner in Los Angeles, Sidecar could be the winner in Chicago, which effectively means you're not talking about a 45% market share even if Uber succeeds you're looking at maybe a 10, 12% market share. What I'm trying to say is my story drives my numbers. 
The story I'm telling here about Uber being a local networking company means my market share stays at 10%, which is a pretty big market share for this market, but it's not 40%. I do assume that Uber has, a, has some competitive advantage. It's competitive advantage in what sense? It's first in the market. You put that app on first, you're most familiar with the app. So these are all small competitive advantages, but they also have connections to drivers, which is drivers might feel more comfortable going with an Uber. So that shows up in what kind of margins I'm going to give them. And the way margins work out in this business is how does Uber make money? Is when you get an Uber car and you pay $10, you actually pay on your credit card because it's already saved into your Uber app. Uber gets to keep 20% of that for them and 80% goes to the driver. But they get to keep 20%. You say as opposed to what? In LA, the, a war is broken out between Uber and Lyft. So in LA, Lyft is offering its drivers 90% of the proceeds instead of 80%. And if they drive more than 40 hours for Lyft, they get to keep 100%. I'm just using that as an example of what happens when you have competition is that share that comes to you, if you're Uber or Lyft, is going to get smaller because that's how these companies are going to compete. I'm going to assume that Uber has enough competitive advantage that can keep a large slice of that 100%. Now, you're, you might say, no, no, there's no way that can happen. It's going to probably drop to 5%. That'll give you a very different valuation of Uber. What I'm trying to say is every number in my valuation, if you ask, why are you using that number? I have to tie back to a story. This is what I think about the company. This is why I'm using the number. It's not about the 100 billion mar total market, 10% market share, 20% slice. It's what I'm using to justify. I'm also going to assume that this is a business where Uber can scale up easily. Why? Because Uber doesn't buy the cars. It doesn't own, you know, employ the drivers. So if it wants to go from 10 cities to 100 cities, it doesn't have to bring in huge amounts of money into the game. It has still has to do marketing, but because of the way it's set up, scaling up is easy to do. Is that good? It's good and it's bad. It's good because that's what Uber can do. It's bad because that's what Lyft can also do. So it's a mixed blessing that they can scale up easily because it's not just that. Okay? So it shows up in their reinvestment needs. And I'm also going to assume that if they can access capital or they have enough capital that they don't have that survival risk that you worry about with young companies. So if you look at my actual valuation, and you can go and you can read my blog post on this, my original valuation of Uber that I also put on 538, it looks like a collection of numbers. In fact, I was accused of being a number cruncher. You don't get this. In fact, most of it was from VCs in Silicon Valley saying, you don't get this. There's a story here. And I said, I have a story too. You just don't like my story. Because every number here is actually based on my narrative, which is it's an urban car service company with local networking benefits and a strong competitive advantage. So see this market going from 100 billion to 180, 179 billion? That's a car service market globally growing. Why? Because Uber is attracting new users into the market. Users like my son would never take a cab, but will take Uber. Why? Because he has my credit card in the Uber. <laughs> so he said, this is free. You know, The marginal cost is nothing. I can go wherever I want. I'm afraid one of these days he'll be in, at home. So what did he do? I took Uber from North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to fix that soon. So that's what drives the total market, is that growth in the market is coming from Uber attracting new users. But it's still an urban car service company. Their market share. I'm assuming it's going to end up at 10%, which sounds like a small number, but I'm assuming that 10% of all urban car service rides 10 years from now, every one out of every 10 rides is going to be an Uber ride globally. That's a pretty strong, you know, pretty large market share. Their revenues, I've left at 20%. So this is a pretty optimistic assumption that 20% slice, I've assumed, is going to be, they're going to be able to maintain because they have more capital, they were first in the market, you know. The end result of all of this, and my cost of capital, basically goes from 12 to 8 percent, reflecting the fact that they become a mature company. And I do allow for the fact that even though they're first in the market, they have a lot of access to capital, they're still young enough that there is this catastrophic risk possibility, which I've attached a 10 percent probability to, which could come from a legal action, it could come from regulatory action that puts an end to the entire company. The net effect of all of those assumptions, the value that I get for the company is about $6 billion. 
six billion for a company that basically has nothing on the ground right now. I thought was a pretty hefty valuation, but no, relative to the 17 billion, of course, it's a much lower number. In about a month and a half after I put that post up, Bill Gurley was one of the venture capitalists, one of the early investors, who was one of those people I respect a lot. For he actually thinks through the numbers, he can actually talk about the numbers. He's not just a storyteller. Put out a counter post. I don't know why he felt this urge to respond to me, because it was not a good thing. Companies should not respond to bloggers valuing the company. It's not a good idea to engage them, right? But he said, Demodern misses by a mile. In fact, I'll send you the link to his post. It was actually a great post. I was sitting in Frankfurt Airport. I opened it up, and I get these hundreds of tweets from him. Have you read this post yet about you? No. And he said, you're missing it. And his was entirely story. He said, what you're missing is it's not just an urban car service company. It's a logistics company with tremendous global networking benefits. We have connections to American Express. So each leg, he was saying, look, you're wrong on that. You're wrong on that. And, I, and after I read this post, I said, you know what? You've given me a nice story. I'll give you the value that you'd get with your story. So what I did was I took his assumption, which was a much bigger market, changed the total market from 100 billion to 300 billion, said your global networking benefits, your market share is going to be 40%, not 10%. And initially he made the, he, made, he said nothing about margin, so I left the margin at 20%. I said, if your story is what plays out, then the value for Uber is 53 billion. You're okay with the $17 billion value. Then he emailed me back saying, look, look, I forgot to mention that if they go this route, they'll probably have to cut prices. Or we'll have to cut prices. Or Uber will have to cut prices. I said, okay, that's easy enough to fix. All I, mean, all I need to do is convert the 20% to 10%. The value that I get is, <coughs> is 29 billion. What I'm trying to say is when you get big differences in value, especially for a young company, it's not because your assumptions are different from my assumptions. That's, of course, the, 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 the front. The real difference is because your narrative is different from mine. And which one of us is going to win out is going to play out in that narrative. So when you're looking at Uber, what you're looking for are changes in that narrative. And in fact, I define with the young companies, I'm looking for, and for the all companies, I'm looking at these with the young companies particularly, I'm looking for narrative breaks. This is deadly when it happens. A narrative break is a story that you were telling until yesterday. It's gone. I'll give you an example. Let's say you were valuing Aereo. Remember Aereo? You could watch cable channels on your phone without paying for cable. It sounded too good to be true. And it turned out to be too good to be true because the Supreme Court last, I don't know what it was, June of last year ruled that you couldn't do this. The day after the Supreme Court judgment came in, guess what happened to Aereo's value? It went to zero because the narr that's a narrative brick where the story you are telling is no longer operative because something fundamental is broken. Hope and pray that doesn't happen in a company you've invested in because that effectively means your value has gone to zero. It could be a narrative shift where your basic business model hasn't changed, but there have been you know, there, there are enough of a shift in it where you might want to revisit that valuation. When I value young companies, every earnings report, that's what I'm looking for. Is there something in this earnings report that should lead me to reassess the narrative? And uh, about six months ago, I posted on Facebook, Twitter, and Apple in this context, where I took the, each of their earnings announcements and said, this is what, because these are companies I've been valuing for almost five years now, four years in each. You know. So I've been doing DCF valuations, and this is how the earnings report changes my view of the company. It's not that your earnings per share last year was three cents above expectations or two cents below expectations that matters. It's is there anything in this report that leads me to change my narrative? And I'll give you the contrast there. I took Facebook and I did I showed all the DCI valuations and I said, if you look at the earnings reports, the narrative for Facebook has shifted. They've been able to get be more successful in mobile than we ever thought they would be. And my initial narrative for Facebook is was going to be a Google wannabe. Not quite as successful, but they were going to try. But as I watched Facebook's earnings reports come out, and they were more and more successful in mobile, my news theory for Facebook is Google might want to become a Facebook wannabe because the, the game seems to have shifted in Facebook's favor, which means my valuation shifts. So if you look at my valuation, it was about $35, I think, before these 
the, those earnings reports, it, it jumped to about 55. You say, but value can't change that much. Sure, it can. If your narrative changes, your value can. So that was my Facebook value change. With Twitter, in contrast, you look at all nine earnings reports. They tell the same thing. So it's like watching, the, it's a definition of insanity, which is we can't figure out how to make money, but we keep trying. We'll do the same thing over and over again. Oh, by the way, we tried to sell stuff on Twitter. It didn't work. And it, there's almost no sense of the narrative thing. So I said, with Twitter, my value stayed stuck at $25, even though the numbers keep coming in, because I don't see evidence that the company's story has changed. It's still an advertising company. It still has to make money on those sponsored tweets. It still has have tr having trouble doing that. And until that story changes, I don't see how Twitter's value can jump to 45 or 65. And the third company I used was Apple. And Apple for a long time in my, uh, and I'm going to do a post next week on Apple again, has been a company that's been stuck around you know, 85 dollars $90, $95 per share, maybe $100 per share. But the September report did contain news about those two big innovations, right? One is the iWatch and the iPay. And I've already mentioned that the iWatch doesn't excite me that much because given the scale of the company, it can't make enough of a difference for me to get excited. It's not going to raise the value by 20 or 25%. But the iPay potentially changes the game. That's enough of a shift. With Uber, actually, it was n it was a, there was no earnings report. Obviously, it was actually a, about six o'clock on a Wednesday evening when my mind changed. My son was at home and he had a friend over, and at six o'clock in the suburbs, when a friend has to go home, a 16-year-old friend, the mom car pulls in. It's like an Uber car, but it's much more efficient usually. It shows up in time, but the mom car comes. In. So at six o'clock comes in, a car pulls into the driveway, and it's a strange car, and I turned to my son's friend and said, who, what, who, who's in that car? He says, I, I, I just called Uber. My valuation of Uber went up by about four billion. <laughs> you can see why, right? What was my story for Uber? Urban. Urban car service company. Here I'm in the middle of suburbia at six o'clock and Uber car is picking up a kid from another kid's house. That requires an amount of trust that normally you don't, you don't send a ca taxi to Small things can change your narrative. Okay? So, it's a, so those are the things you're looking for with young startups is don't get caught up just in the numbers. Think about the story because the story is driving evaluation. And that's why as part of your DCF valuation, I'd like you to tell me what the story is you're telling about your company and whether you're comfortable with that story. I'll send you a link to, um, to a presentation I made at the CFA conference last year. It's, um, it's about three hours long on stories and numbers, so don't watch the whole thing unless you want to torture yourself. But it goes through this process of going from stories to numbers in a lot more detail. Because to me, that is the secret to doing a good valuation, is being able to tell a story you're comfortable with, and then take that story and convert it to numbers that actually back up that story. So let me get started. I know we're, we've done a lot today. At least get started on what we're going to be doing for the next two or three sessions. We're going to be doing some actual valuation. If you think about it, it's about 12 sessions into the class. We haven't valued a single company all the way through. We've taken little bits of this and little bits of that, cost of capital for Abbev and cash flows for Disney. We didn't, we've never valued a company. So now we're going to actually value about 15 companies in two sessions. Now, to save myself some trouble, on one of the inputs you're going to see in all of these companies is every discounted cash flow valuation requires an equity risk premium. So I'll give you my priors and what you're going to see in all these valuations so I don't have to keep saying it for every valuation. Pre-1998 valuations, I think there's one company that's a pre-98 valuation. I used to use a historical risk premium to value companies. I used to use around 5.5%. About a decade ago, I stopped using historical premiums. I switched to implied premium between 98 and September of 2008. I used to use um, um, an equity risk premium of about 4% for mature markets, and I pretty much left it at that, using the defense that equity risk premiums can't change that much in mature markets. You see why I stopped doing that in September of 2008? Because mm -hmm. then the fig leaf was gone, because then I saw how much equity risk premiums could change. Since 2000, September of 2008, my discounted cash flow valuations have different equity risk premiums each year, usually based on whatever the equity risk premium is, either at the start of the year or the start of the month of the valuation. So you're going to see numbers jump around. So if you look at a particular valuation, say, why is the equity risk premium different in this valuation than this one? Just look at the timing of the valuation. 
And if I were doing a valuation in March of 2015, the equity risk premium I'd be using would be about 5.7%. That's the equity risk premium at the start of March. So you're going to see the number become a lot more dynamic post-2008 because it's become a much more volatile number. So here's my first valuation. Let's, get, let's start easy. It's a valuation of Con Ed. Regulated utility. Can't get any easier than this, right? So you're doing a valuation for a sixth grade class. This would be it. Because you can pretty much, and you know, everything kind of ties together. Now. So I'm not meaning it as an insult, but this should be easy. Right? I'm going to value the company using a dividend discount model. Might as well do it, right? This is a company that pays out roughly its free cash or equity as dividends. I'm going to use a stable growth model. Why? It's a regulated utility in New York City. You see why it matters? If, I, if you're a regulated utility in the mountain states, maybe you can talk about population growth. And there's nothing. That, none of those things can bail you out. And so I'm going to use a stable growth dividend discount model to value this company, which means all I need is three numbers, right? The stable growth dividend discount model, what I need is expected dividends next year, my stable growth rate, and a cost of equity. So let's start with the dividends. The dividends paid, and, and before I do this, I want to make sure that I'm not on the wrong path because I want to make sure this model is okay. And there are three tests I'm going to run. First is, if I'm going to use the dividend discount model, I want to make sure this company is paying dividends like a mature company. What do I mean by that? If I saw the payout ratio be 10% or 15%, I can't use a stable growth dividend discount model because that dividend payout ratio is not consistent with a stable growth rate. For Con Ed, that number in 2008, was about 73%. So it pays out almost three quarters of its earnings as dividends. So test one passes. It looks like a mature company in terms of how much of its earnings it paid out as, pays out as dividends. Second, I wanted to make sure the growth rate I was going to end up with was not much higher than the growth rate of the economy, right? Because I'm going to use the stable growth model. So I took the retention ratio, which is one minus the payout ratio, 27%. I multiplied by the return on equity, which is roughly equal to the cost of equity. You know why? How do regulated utilities, how do they get to price electricity, or in this, case, in this case power? They have to go to a regulatory commission. The regulatory commission actually looks at their cost of equity. It's one of the few businesses where cost of equity actually is an explicit input into the process. Then they let them set prices to earn roughly their cost of equity. So almost by regulation, it's going to be very difficult for them to earn more than the cost of equity because if they do, they're not going to get price increases for the next five years. So I feel I'm on pretty safe ground, assuming the return equity is roughly equal to the cost of equity. And if I multiply the retention ratio by the return equity, I get a 2.1% growth rate. I want to make sure that's not higher than the growth rate of the economy, right? What was the simple proxy I suggested for the growth rate in the economy you could use? Just use the risk-free rate. I check the risk-free rate, which is 4.1%. I'm very safe, right? My growth rate is 2.1%. I'm assuming the risk-free um, risk rate is 4. Point. So I'm okay. If, if I'd come up with 6% here, then I have to go to a two-stage model. It's not the end of the world, but it means I can't use a stable growth model. Test three, I checked to see that they had a beta that was considered with a mature company. You think, what do you mean? Your beta is two, then I can't use a stable growth model because that's not consistent with a mature company. That's a high risk company, and either I have to bring your risk down or look to see what's driving that risk. But in this case, the beta that I got was 0.8, which is roughly what regulated you to, just close to what a mature company should be. I use that beta to come up with my cost of equity. My cost of equity is risk free rate plus beta times my equity risk premium, 7.7%. So stable growth dividend discount model should work. It pays out dividends like a mature company. It has a growth rate less than the risk-free rate, and its cost of equity looks like that of a mature company. So I said, okay, let's project out the dividends next year. I took the dividends from last year, 232, grew it at 2.1%, which is my growth rate, divided by cost of equity, 7.7% minus 2.1%. The value per share that I get is $42.30. The stock was actually trading at 4076. Some of you are saying maybe I should change companies. Connor to be no a company like this. Look, you'd be done in 15 minutes, right? Just reject, take the dividends next year, cost of it. And it's true, value Connor is pretty trivial. 
I'm getting a value that is slightly higher than the market price. Right? But that's driven primarily by the cost of equity is the cost of equity. The dividends are not going to be madly different from what I'm estimating. So in fact, what I did was I backed out, given the growth rate, what the, diff, what the value per share would be to figure out what growth rate I would need to get to $40.76. Think of it as an imputed growth rate. It's actually an interesting exercise to always do after evaluation is ask what would the growth rate need to be for the value per share to be roughly equal to the price per share. In this case, the growth rate would have to be like 2.03%. How am I going to use that? I have almost no margin for error, right? I'm not going to go crazy and go buy 100,000 shares or a million shares of Con Ed because at my value, I'm close enough to the price. But at least it gives me a sense of what that buffer is because if the break-even growth rate had been 0.5% and I'm at 2.1%, that's a danger sign. But the break-even growth rate is 2.05%. It's not, it's, it's not that different. So when you do your valuation of a company, this is actually very easy to do. Use your Excel solver function. You can solve for the growth rate. Even in a high growth period, say, what would the growth rate need to be to come to the price that I see for the stock today and compare it to your projected growth rate? One final point, and we'll end for today. A lot of equity research reports are stated not in terms of, because what I've given you is a value today and a price today. But for whatever reason, the, the sell side equity research at least, the price is always stated as a target price, which gives you, I guess, enough, some leeway before the price actually occurs so nobody can hold you accountable for a little while. So let's say you are an equity research analyst. Okay? Let's say the numbers I've done are pretty reasonable numbers, 7.7% 7 .7 cost of equity. And dividends of 20, and current stock prices for and, and that the value per share is 4230. That's the value today. And I ask you to tell me what your target price will be for the stock one year from now. Can you convert a DCF value today to a target price a year from today? What would you need to do? Yes. That's the first step, but you're not. So you take 4230 and grow it at 7.7 percent, and then there's one more step you need to do. That's your total return, right? And your total return comes from. Well, the re but subtract out the dividends, right? Basically, the dividends are a portion. So the 7.7 percent is your total return. Some of it is going to come from dividends, some from price appreciation. So if you take the 7.7% uh, and you grow 42.30 at 7.7%, I don't know what you get. You get 45 something. Then you subtract out the dividends, you get a target price one year from now. What if I want a target price two years from now? Just do 1.077 squared and subtract out dividends for the next two years. You can go crazy. Give me target prices for the next 10 years. Once you do a DCF valuation, you can convert it to whatever you want. You can make it target prices five years out, three years out. All you have to do is factor in the cost of equity, which is your expected return on the stock, and subtract out whatever cash flows you collect as dividends over the period. You should be able to convert any DCF value into a target price. In fact, I did compute what the target price is. If, if any of you did it mathematically, let's see if I got the right answer. I think the value that I got was... $43.19. So basically it's a 40 to 30 but the, plus the price appreciation portion of the 7.7%. So if I were writing an equity research report, my target price would be 43.19. And if you take today's stock price, which is 40.76, and if I'm right about my DCF valuation, I'm going to earn well above 7.7%, right? Because I'm going to see the 40.76 go to 43.19 plus I'm going to collect the dividends. So all I'm saying is, if your job is to get target prices, don't give up on DC evaluation. You can still do a DC evaluation, come up with a value per share today, and then use it to get projected prices one year out or two years out. Joseph? No, no, this is based on the cost of equity. So even if your return equity were 23%, this would still work. Oh, okay. 
Because once you come up with the DCF valuation, that actually is the value given that you want to earn 7.7% .7 a year. So it's completely in sense independent of what you're assuming about the return equity. So it's a pure cost of equity assumption. That's what a DCF valuation delivers. Okay? So let's stop there. We will continue on one sec.